Okay, well, good morning, Graham, and good morning. Um, thank you very much for agreeing to uh, to this this interview. Um, my name is William Rowlands, and I'm um, here working with uh, Jack Hunter for Jack's uh, excellent journal of uh, power anthropology. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we'll do is uh, I have a series of questions which uh, which you've already seen, so we can work through some of your responses. Um, in particular, we'll be talking about your forthcoming book, War God. Yeah. Um, and we'll be bringing in other aspects of your previous work and of your recent trip to Brazil as we uh, as we go on. Mm -hmm. um, so to to start with, concerning War God, War God um, when we met last um, back in uh, the Breaking Convention conference at uh, the University of Kent in 2011, um, you mentioned that you'd received the inspiration both for Entangled, your previous novel, and for War God during some ayahuasca visions. Are you, uh, would you like to explain about that? Yes, I mean, I, I realize that a lot of people listening to this may not even know what ayahuasca is, or if they know what it is, they might not want to have anything to do with it. But it is um, an ancient uh, shamanistic brew. It's a combination of two plants from the Amazon jungle. One of them is Banisteriopsis carpi, which is a vine which is known as the ayahuasca vine and ayahuasca means the vine of souls and the other is Cicotria viridis which is known in the Amazon as chacruna um, and the leaves of Cicotria viridis uh, contain dimethyltryptamine DMT which is of course a, a class A drug in Britain and a schedule 1 drug highly illegal uh, in the United States the mystery of uh, this brew that they make in the Amazon, because basically what they do is marry together those two plants and cook them with water for a long time, resulting in a, a vile tasting beverage, which is, which is highly psychoactive. The, the, the mystery of all this is that the dimethyltryptamine is normally not uh, available to us orally uh, because of the enzyme monoamine oxidase in our gut which neutralizes uh, DMT on contact. Um, but somehow, and the shamans of the Amazon say that their ancestors were taught to do this by the spirits, they selected those two plants out of what, 100 or 150,000 different species of plants and trees that grow in the Amazon. Uh, and those two plants taken together do allow the DMT in the leaves to become orally active and that's so because amongst other ingredients the ayahuasca vine contains a monoamine oxidase inhibitor so there's really quite an advanced bit of pharmacology going on here uh, in, in, in the Amazon it's really difficult to figure out how anybody did this by trial and error you know um, but by putting those two plants together, we get orally active DMT. Um, however, the, the ayahuasca journey is quite different from the, the kind of experience that people in the West, a number will have had, smoking pure DMT. It's an ex smoking pure DMT is an extremely intense, very short acting, but incredibly powerful um, psychoactive journey with, 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 with which I would say there is no negotiation whatsoever. I've smoked DMT 11 times myself and one of the characteristics of, of DMT is it just takes things right out of your hands. You can't really resist it. You get taken to wherever it takes you and we could talk for hours about wherever that is. But with ayahuasca, although the DMT is the primary active ingredient, there is much more negotiation with the experience of, of visionary journey. And the archaeological evidence says that ayahuasca has been used by shamanistic cultures in the Amazon for at least 4,000 years, probably much longer than that. And it's a pan-Amazonian phenomenon. Uh, it, it's found r r right throughout, throughout the Amazon region, goes back a very long way, used by more than 70 different uh, in indigenous cultures and always for gaining access to what is construed as the spirit world, as this other realm filled with uh, intelligent beings that have teachings to give us. And those teachings are often to do with healing, but not only to do with healing. There's a tremendous uh, creative inspiration uh, in ayahuasca, and it's notable that many of the indigenous tribes in the Amazon that use ayahuasca 
when they return to the normal day-to-day -day state of consciousness, they manifest their visions in, in paintings and designs, which may be in textiles, maybe on, on pottery, maybe paintings on, on bark. Um, and, and ayahuasca has spread uh, into the wider community in, in South America. It's massively used amongst the, the mestizo community around uh, Iquitos and, and Pucallpa in uh, Amazonian Peru. Uh, and it's been taken up by two established churches, uh, in actually more than two, but the best known two are the, are the Santo Deme and the Unidad de Vegetal in Brazil, for whom ayahuasca is their sacrament. Um, and they have regular sessions of, of ayahuasca as a vehicle for contacting the, the divine. And governments in South America, by and large, taken, uh, I would say, a very uh, intelligent and sensible view of this problem, despite enormous pressure from the war on drugs lobby in the United States. They have insisted that the right to use ayahuasca in South America is a fundamental human right connected to the ancient culture of the region and is primarily a religious and spiritual uh, pursuit. So they basically told the United States and its heavy-handed lobbyists to clear off and stay out of their business because this is this is their fundamental right to to work with this with this sacrament. And as a result, the use of ayahuasca is uh, is legal throughout the countries that surround the the uh, Amazon basin. Now, to get back to your question, you asked about the inspiration that I had received for, for writing fiction uh, from ayahuasca. And I've already made the point that, that one of the things that ayahuasca has been traditionally known for is as a creative inspiration. Whatever you're good at, ayahuasca tends to give you, it's a mystery why, but it tends to give you some insight, some inspiration, which helps you to do that a little bit better or in a different way. And we're seeing this uh, in the West with, um, with artists, uh, for example, Alex Gray at the Chapel of the Sacred Mirrors in, in New York, uh, the late uh, Robert Venosa in Boulder, Colorado, uh, Martina Hoffman, his, his partner, also in Boulder. These are artists who have worked extensively with ayahuasca and whose work has been massively influenced by ayahuasca and you see a transformation in their work and whole new categories of images and, and ideas coming across and being expressed in the art which definitely would not have been there and they themselves say this if they hadn't had the ayahuasca experience. Now I can't paint to save my life, I, I'm just absolutely useless with painting and drawing um, but, but the creative gift that I have such as it is, is in the field of writing and ayahuasca did directly influence me uh, in, in that field. And this was partly because I asked it to do so. Um, when, when I received the, the inspiration for uh, Entangled back in 2007, um, I went to Brazil with the intention of seeking a novel. Uh, it, it's useful in an ayahuasca ceremony to have some intention. One can say, let the vine show me what it wishes to, but you can also say, I would like to see this. Can I, can I be helped to, to see it? And that's, that's what I did. I, I basically said, I'm quite tired of writing nonfiction. I'm quite tired of massive 800 page books with 2000 footnotes. I'm quite tired of rigorously defending my arguments against uh, attack uh, and I feel like a little more freedom in my writing. Besides, I'm getting older. I only have so long on the planet. I would like to do some different things with my work. What, what shall I do? Is there, is there a story here? And Ayahuasca in those sessions came back to me instantly with, yes, there's a story. And it's a story about the battle of good against evil. And it's a story across time. And here's a young woman, 24,000 years ago. Here's another one today. And I, was and I was shown them. And they're connected. They're entangled. Time is not how we understand it. It's not an arrow. It's not a straight line. It's a cat's cradle of intersecting cycles and circles. And they are brought together by an angelic being who I associated very much with the entity that those of us who, who work with ayahuasca a lot tend to call Mother Ayahuasca. She could be the mother goddess of our planet. She could be a figment of the imagination, but it's curious that people all over the world have an experience of an encounter with this intelligent feminine entity under the influence of ayahuasca. Um, and, and, and I saw this, this figure that I called the Blue Angel 
uh, in, in Entangled as, as being the benign supernatural force that brought together these two young women separated by 24,000 years to do battle with a, with a demon who is traveling through time and whose purpose is to mislead mankind that we have a divine spark within ourselves but that something, some power, some force in the universe wishes us not to recognize that and wishes us to take a dark and evil path and, and therefore the role of these two young women was to oppose that force in the two time frames. I was shown this very clearly, I was shown scenes, I was shown battles that took place later on in the writing of the novel. Uh, I w and most significant of all for me, um, I was told, Hancock, you were wrong about the Neanderthals. Because I wrote an earlier non-fiction book, in fact it was the last non-fiction book I wrote, called Supernatural, um, which itself was, um, it, it was during the research for Supernatural, which is really a book about shamanism and altered states of consciousness and the origins of modern human behavior during the research for Supernatural that I first started to drink ayahuasca. I wanted to understand what these experiences were rather than just read about them in books. But in that, in that book, in Supernatural, I did address the issue of the Neanderthals and I was at that time very much persuaded by what was then the mainstream academic line, which is that Neanderthals were not symbolic creatures. That they, yes they had these big brains, we don't know why, Neanderthal brain was a little bit bigger than the anatomically modern human brain. Um, yes, they had been in command of Ice Age Europe for 200,000 years before the ancestors of anatomically modern humans appeared in Europe about 50,000 years ago. But that somehow the Neanderthals were stupid, brutish, uh, that they had no symbolic life, that they had no spiritual life. Everything that was purported to be a Neanderthal burial had been shown by some academic or other to be just an accidental accretion of different objects, a few f seeds and flowers and things here and there. They, they dismissed it totally. And as I investigated it, I thought, well, actually, they're probably right about that. I couldn't, I didn't see any evidence for Neanderthal painting. And I thought, yes, pro and so in Supernatural, I presented the Neanderthals very much in the main, in what was then the mainstream academic way, as rather brutish um, and limited creatures. But what I was shown in, in my ayahuasca visions was that that was not so, that these were in incredible, uh, creative, beautiful spirited creatures who, who just glowed with, with goodness and that really our ancestors, the ancestors of anatomically modern humans coming into Europe would never have survived if the Neanderthals hadn't shown them what to do and hadn't shown them the way. And well, you can hear the, the I feel the emotion as, as I'm talking about this because it was like a, a revelation to me. I got this completely wrong. I, I, I did a huge disservice to the Neanderthals. Entangled is my opportunity to put that right, to show that, that, that there was something really special and wonderful to these creatures and that they were the, the, the essence of them was pure love and goodness and that they communicated uh, te telepathically and that although they did not leave a lot because it's beginning to look now like Neanderthals did leave some cave paintings although they did not leave a lot of paintings on cave walls they did paint their bodies and of course that hasn't survived in the in in the archaeological record and most important of all they were the ones who taught our ancestors how to paint they were the ones who introduced our ancestors to the experience that brought through the cave paintings. And that experience, and this is one of the reasons I wrote Supernatural, um, it's really very well established by researchers like Professor David Lewis Williams at the University of Witwatersrand uh, and others. And of course, Terence McKenna went this way as well with his book, uh, Food of the Gods, that the origin of modern symbolic human behavior is very likely to have been as a result of experiences in altered states of consciousness, whether brought about by fasting, by sensory deprivation, by trance dancing, or by the use of visionary plants. And, and it, it, the idea that came to me in the visions was that it was the Neanderthals who introduced anatomically modern humans in Europe to visionary plants and gave them the inspiration that led to the, the cave painting. So. My Neanderthals, who are called by anatomically modern humans later on, they refer to them as the uglies uh, in, in, in Entangled, 
are, um, I believe I've done justice to them there, that they are these, these beautiful spirited beings with, with incredible creative power and, and that they are fundamentally, that their essence is goodness and love. And, and this again was, was, was a revelation to me uh, in, in vision. But it was rather nice as the years went by to see academic research moving in this direction and, and beginning in the last few years to recognize the symbolic and creative aspects of the, of the Neanderthals um, and, and also to embrace the possibility, still controversial, that I, that I also open up in Entangled that there may have been um, uh, interbreeding between Neanderthals and, and anatomically modern humans. That idea was completely off the cards in 2004 but it's very much on the agenda uh, today so I got a lot of insights in those visions that, that played directly into this story but at the heart of it at the heart of it a dualistic view of the universe a battle of good against evil and the responsibility of human beings uh, to, to choose and if you like uh, a catch line that uh, evil cannot always be defeated but it can always, it can always be resisted, and that's within the power of human choice. Okay, so talking about the antiquity of human civilization, it's been characterised by conflict, combat, uh, territorial expansion, always since the earliest days. So, with that being the case in relation to um, uh, modern humans and Neanderthals, why did you feel this? this need to frame it within a within a battle of good versus evil as opposed to victims and victimizers well it's interesting i don't see in the early part once we once we know that our anatomically modern humans are present in in europe roughly 50 to 40000 years ago i don't see in the early days much evidence at all for um, negative aggressive violent acquisitive behavior in the archaeological record. Of course the archaeological record is very thin, but what there is doesn't strongly suggest that our early ancestors of the Upper Paleolithic were particularly much in the business of territorial acquisition and violence in the way that we have become. Rather that this was something that descended upon us over, over a certain period of time. And that's why the, the fundamental dilemma in Entangled is what actually happened to the Neanderthals. You know, because this is, this is actually a, a mystery of, of prehistory. We don't know what happened to the Neanderthals. We do know that they ceased to exist as a species. And roughly when that happened, although there's some debaters that could be as recently as, as 24,000 years ago, could be a bit earlier than that. It's just, not, it's just not clear. What happened to them? A lot of speculation suggests that our ancestors wiped them out. That they, that they reached a point, having coexisted with them for 20,000 years, that something changed and they turned on the Neanderthals and, and destroyed them. Um, and, and that possibility is envisaged in Entangled, but it's left open. Um, it's not certain, and it turns out that this, is, that this is precisely what the human protagonist, the young woman, uh, Rhea, 24,000 years in the story, it turns out precisely that's what her mission to do is to stop that happening. Mm -hmm. That some kind of karmic burden or debt is laid upon humanity if we do wipe out the Neanderthals. We must not do that. And right now it's unobserved, it's unclear what happened and one of the, I suppose, the radical ideas in Entangled is that that which has not been observed in the past may be changed that it's fluid, that it's, not, that it's not certain what it was. And so we find ourselves set in this period of 24,000 years ago when, when a, a, a demonic army of, of furious and violent humans is actively seeking to destroy the Neanderthals and, and they're led by a demon in human form who gains his psychic charge from destroying goodness. That's why he wants to wipe out the Neanderthals and they're misled in the direction of doing this. That is, that is happening and that's precisely when Rhea is injected into the story and her mission is to stop that happening. So ultimately we will learn and I'm you know, giving away later aspects of the story because there's a second volume of Entangled to come that the annihilation of the Neanderthals by anatomically modern humans is stopped and that they die out 
for a completely other reason, which is not, which does not incur a karmic burden uh, on the on on on, on the on the human race. Um, what I did feel, as we look at the archaeological record, as we come down through the thousands of years, is that something does change in human behaviour. That we start out in the in the Upper Paleolithic. 50,000 years ago or so with no evidence of violence but by the time you get into the Neolithic we're a pretty horrific lot um, and and something has entered the human psyche that didn't seem to have been there before and that's where I think it's interesting to speculate um, about the possibility of dark and negative influences at the spiritual level and positive and benign influences and the human dilemma always always is the dilemma to choose uh, between between the two uh, a friend of mine calls this world this realm that we live in uh, a universe a university a university of duality and i think that's a rather interesting idea because a lot of people object to the idea of duality and would like everything just to be one and and all beautiful it's all goodness and whatever whatever duality there is is something that we're just we're, we're just projecting but I'm not sure how much we would have to learn from a world like that I think that I think duality is actually a very useful teaching tool um, and that without it it's very difficult to make choices that that define us it is not all there is but in this particular experience, in the experience of being a human, in a human body, in this physical realm, uh, duality has very important lessons to teach us. And were it to be taken away, what choices would we have to make? And if we didn't make choices, how could we grow? How could we learn? How could we develop? Are there not um, potential dangers, though, with such a viewpoint of duality, in the sense of you become, the individual becomes the arbiter of what is good and what is bad? Now, again, has history not shown numerous people working in, in a direction that they perceive to be good that may be deemed by history to have been bad. Um, sure, good point. W and furthermore, is there something which is perhaps slightly um, going against a number of mystical traditions, both Christian mysticism and um, what might be called agnostic mysticism, as well as more Eastern forms of spiritual um, uh, thinking, of unity that that the good and the bad are always together, the the black and the white are always together, night and day. There's this there's this there's this harmony of polarity mm. as opposed to a battle of polarity. Well, those are those are very interesting points. In ancient Egypt, um, the polarity, the duality, was represented by Horus and Set. So Horus, the forces of light, the sun, goodness, virtue, Set, chaos, disaster, misery, evil. Um, and and it's very interesting. I mean, re really, if you want to inquire into spiritual matters, you, you can just go to the ancient Egyptians. They have a lot to teach us on that. And it's very interesting at Dendera that there's a that there's a single figure with two heads, and those two heads are the heads of Horus and Set. Um, and I think they're telling us something something there. So yes, I mean, I don't disagree that there is an overarching oneness, but I still feel very strongly that remove the need to choose between different courses of action and you remove a fundamental teaching tool I mean nobody knows what we're doing here on this earth in this in this physical realm there really is no science cannot claim to have the answer to that science may say materialist you know Western reductionist science tends to say that this is all just an accident that there is absolutely no purpose to it whatsoever that it's just random processes working through that led to the evolution of life that there is no such thing as the spirit that when we die we're dead there is no conscious survival of death in any form uh, this is not me saying this this is I'm trying to summarize the the the, the model of reductionist uh, Western science and that in a, in a word there is no purpose to it no transcendent purpose whatsoever it's just purely accidental and science may be right about that but it equally well could be completely wrong about that um, and and another possibility has to be has to be considered that that there is such a thing as quote unquote the soul that consciousness may be a fundamental force of the universe rather than an epiphenomenon of brain processes uh, that consciousness may be engaged in a, a gigantic universal project of growth and development 
and that what we have here on this earth in a physical incarnation in a world with physical and material consequences is an opportunity to learn and to learn by the choices we make and to be defined by the choices we make and perhaps even to have the opportunity to come back and learn lessons again and again and again. After all, many wise ancient cultures say that. They say that we do reincarnate, we do come back again and again and that there's a, pro there's a project going on, there's a, there's a reason for that. And if that were the case, then I can see a tremendous value to duality and to the need uh, to, to, to make these choices. And yes, it's true that different what, what may be evil for one culture may be regarded as good by another culture. Um, and the same action, for example, killing another person, might in one circumstance be regarded as incredibly evil and wicked, and might in another circumstance be regarded as actually a really good thing mm -hmm. to do. I think most people wouldn't, you know, wouldn't dispute that it would probably have been a good thing to kill Hitler. Um, but it would still have involved killing uh, a, another human being. So we get into very complicated moral uh, yeah. inquiries and, and choices here, which it's difficult actually to resolve. But I think it can be reduced to fairly simple, a fairly simple level. Does the action that I am about to take transgress on the sovereignty of others? Does the action that I am about to take add even one iota to the misery in the world or does it reduce it and i think if we ask ourselves those questions then what is good and what is evil um, become a little clearer to define so in the hitler case you could say you know that if someone had actually put a bullet through his head in 1937 they would indeed have killed a fellow human being, but they would have prevented on the sovereignty of millions of human beings as a result of that. And that might in some way mitigate uh, the nature of the action. Of course, it's very easy to say that with hindsight. Yeah. You know, we couldn't, absolutely, we couldn't absolutely tell where Hitler was going to go in 1937, although it was pretty clear by then where he was where he was going to go so yeah very fine distinctions to be made very difficult dis distinctions to be made but I think if we all examine our hearts we do actually have some kind of compass on this which which you know we do know this isn't really the right thing to say this isn't really the right thing to do that that, that voice is there and, and it I, I'm not sure that it's entirely culturally constrained and uh, on that note, and continuing this, this, this particular line of inquiry, going back to your novels, um, in investing so much narrative space to the darkness, to the brutality, is this in some way exorcising it? Are you hoping, as, <coughs> as you say about this, this, this repetition of events and, the, and this ancient conflict, is your choice here to to focus to such a degree on the darkness as a means of opening it up, allowing people to to see it for what it is? Is this is there some purpose to this? Yeah, I do in Entangled and latterly in War God focus a lot on very negative human behaviour and uh, and and I describe uh, scenes of violence in considerable detail. And it's very difficult for me as a human and as a writer uh, to write those scenes. It, mm. it causes me pain. But I feel that it's essential for me to do so. And there's a number of reasons why I feel that. One is that we have, I've observed, a tremendous capacity as a species for denial. Mm -hmm. That if something is painful or difficult, we look away. We tend not to want to focus on it. We may even persuade ourselves that that's the right thing to do, but it's precisely in that act of looking away that we allow the wickedness to flourish. Whereas in fact, we should focus our attention on it and willfully seek to stop it. And that requires knowing what it is. A, a, a lot of people who, um, who have read Entangled and not liked it have not liked it because of the violence. I, I can't tell you how many letters I've received 
which which told me that they were so deeply offended by the violence in Entangled, and that you know we we have to concentrate on on goodness only, and, and uh, we, uh, it's all goodness really, and all light. And I have I have to reply to that. Not a single action that is described in Entangled was made up by me. Everything that happens in there, whether it's the castration of enemies and the wearing of their genitals on one's head, uh, or or whether it's various disgusting forms of human sacrifice. All of these things, all of them, every one of them, have been done by human cultures, and some of them are still being done by human cultures today. This is part of the human phenomenon. And I think if we turn our heads away and don't look at that and pretend that everything is a rosy glow of goodness, we'll never deal with those problems. So what I'm wanting to do with this writing is to put that right up front and to put it into the faces of my readers and say, here it is, this happened, this happens, it's a reality, deal with it. Mm. That's what we need to do as a species. If we're going to move on out of this dark place, and the world is in a very dark place right now, and horrendous things are happening all over the world, we're not going to solve those problems by pretending they don't exist. Mm. We have to confront them, and, and, and in order to confront them, they have to be expressed. And I've, I've felt that it, in, in my writing, it's my role to express them, not with a view to reveling in them or enjoying them, but rather to showing my readers what these things are mm. and, and hopefully ra raising the opportunity to, to address. I always do also try to show that there are good forces at work as well and that again and again and again it comes down to choice. You know, Cortez could have made different choices. When he, when he entered Mexico. Moctezuma and the Aztecs, the, the Mexica, could have made different choices. I, 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 for me, it's interesting to speculate what would have happened to the world uh, if things had gone differently during the Spanish conquest of Mexico. And it's one of the reasons that I've written War God, as a matter of fact. Um, it's very clear, Cortes turns up on the coast of Mexico with 490 men, and he is confronting a, a large, organized state, which is the Mexica state. People call them the Aztecs, but they're, they're better known as the, as the Mexica. And it seems, it, it seems implausible somehow that even though they have a few guns and 18 or 16 cavalry and, and some military science, it seems implausible that this tiny band of Spaniards are going to overthrow this, this gigantic and, and truly violent state. I mean, the, the Mexica were into systematic organized state violence and terrorism. They used human sacrifice, not only to placate their gods, but as a means of terrorizing their neighbors. And they would put on spectacles of human sacrifice for their neighbors to show their neighbors what would happen to them if they stopped paying tribute or didn't do exactly what they were told. So it, it seems implausible that this tiny Spanish army could, not even an army, it's just a bunch of freebooters, could turn up and overthrow this gigantic edifice. But I maintain, and what I'm trying to show in War God, is that the reason they were over able to overthrow it was precisely because of the choices that the Aztecs, the Mexica, had made. If Moctezuma had reversed this policy of human sacrifice, if he had sought to cultivate friendship with his neighbors, if he had behaved in a loving and generous way towards neighboring peoples, then they would not have joined Cortes. That, that's really why Cortes won, because he was able to recruit hundreds of thousands of local auxiliaries, people who absolutely detested the Aztecs. And they detested them for very good reasons, because the Aztecs were coming along, not only extracting taxes and tribute from them, but taking their young men and women and murdering them on the sacrificial stone. Mm. It's very reasonable if somebody comes along and says, I can free you from that, to say, absolutely, let's mm -hmm. go for it. And that's why, that's why Cortes won. So a choice was there, always was there with the Aztecs, with Moctezuma. They could have chosen not to pursue that route anymore. And had they made that choice, I believe that Cortes would have been confronted by a united opposition on the coast of Mexico. Yeah. And he would have been wiped out. Mm -hmm. And the whole European venture of colonialism that followed would have had to have been rethought. If, if, if they had faced a truly powerful and united force in Mexico, I think, I think it would have affected the entire way that Europe related 
to the countries that it invaded and colonized in the decades subsequently. I mean, it's immediately obvious in the Spanish conquest of Peru, which happened just a decade or so later, which literally followed the Cortes model to the, to the letter. But it's obvious also much more widely around the world that European powers were persuaded that they could easily destroy and the, these so-called primitive and disorganized forces that confronted them. If they'd been taught a very sharp lesson at the time of Cortes, the whole model, I believe, would have been different. And the world that we live in today would have been radically different. And in addition to the cruelty of the Mexica, the Aztec, there's obviously the other aspect which Octavio Paz concentrates on in Labyrinth of Solitude, that the Mexica people were actually aware of the ending of a particular cycle. Yes. And do, do you, in your research and in your, your investigation into this, do you think that there was also a certain surrendering um, before the Spaniards as, well, a, as a fatalistic sense of inevitability? Um, that, that's complicated. I think that, if, first, first of all, the notion of the return of Quetzalcoatl um, and the, the notion that an age of the world was coming to an end uh, was, was certainly very strong uh, in Mexican society at that, at that time. Revisionist history has tried to uh, intervene, really, that wasn't going on, but I, I don't agree with that. I think, I think it's very clear from original documentation of the period that this was a very central part of Mexico, and indeed broadly Central American thinking at that time. Um, I mean, a lot of people say that the notion of the, the white bearded god who's returning is something that the friars made up. But, you know, if you go to La Venta, um, where we have the remains of the, of the Olmec culture, you will find uh, sculptures of, of uh, I, I mean, I know it's not politically correct to say this, but I'm just reporting a fact. You will find sculptures that are at least 3,500 years old that show individuals who do actually look like Caucasians mm -hmm. with large beards. Um, and those are found elsewhere in Mexico uh, as well, such as at, as at Monte Alban, often in very old sites long predating this period. So this idea, there's something to this idea, and it's been expressed in iconography much long before the time of the of the of the Aztecs, so I think it was a very real idea, and the and the notion that there's there's a curious there's a curious series of events that Quetzalcoatl is associated with the year one read. The, 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 there's a sort of cycle of fifty two revolving years, and uh, rather like the Chinese calendar has twelve named years, of fifty two in the Mexican calendar, and the. And the, what, the, the year that's associated with Quetzalcoatl is one read, and that's the year that he's born, supposedly, that's the year that he's expelled, and that's the year that he's supposed to return. And it, it just so happens that 1519, when Cortes turned up on the coast mm. of the Gulf Coast of Mexico, was the year one read. I mean, this, this actually, even in any European culture of that time, Europe was a pretty superstitious place at that time, such a coincidence would have been noted. Uh, and we can be absolutely certain that it was noted by Moctezuma and, mm. the, and the Mexica. And it's also very clear from the, the, the documentation of the period that, that Moctezuma was quite convinced that he was dealing with the, re the return of Quetzalcoatl, with the return of a god. At first, he was, he was convinced of that. And I think that Cortes, who, if he was anything, was a skillful Machiavellian player, mm -hmm. I think that Cortes very quickly learned of that, and in my in my story, I have him ultimately learning of it from Malinal, the woman who becomes his interpreter and and mistress. Very quickly learned of that and exploited it and and used it. He was very clever. He never said, "I am Quetzalcoatl." Hmm. He let them say it, hmm. and that was really one of the smartest things he did. He just left it to their own superstitious context to fill in the details and to revere in theory. And after all, he did have these formidable weapons. You know, they called them zihuacoatl in the, in the Mexican tradition, fire serpents. The, 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 this notion that the gods had fire serpents that could destroy and dismember men um, aided him in his, in his conquest. But whether Moctezuma, as my reading of him, the man is a very weak and uh, at, the heart of, at the heart of things. But there were others amongst the Mexica. Who, who were not cowardly, for example, Guatemoc, who mounted a fierce resistance to Cortes. So, so the notion that the Mexica simply surrendered to Cortes, yeah. I think, is not correct. Once they, once they really figured it out, and they did, after Moctezuma was gone, they really figured it out, that these, 
that these things that are attacking us are human beings just like us, just a bit better armed, maybe a bit better organized, but they are men and we're not going to let them walk all over us. That resistance did mount and it mounted very, str very strongly. I mean, the, the um, defense of Tenochtitlan at the, at the end was bitterly fought, mm. bitterly fought over a very substantial mm. period of time and, and required, I think, enormous courage on the part of the Mexica to, to mount that defense, although yeah. in the end they were overrun. Now, and another question related to this. Would you think that you might be doing a bit of a disservice to some of the Christians? Um, who were with the Spaniards from the early days of conquest. Not necessarily a man like Las Casas, who, who, but, but numerous other mendicant friars, people who went without a sword, with yes. Franciscans, for example, who went with the message of peace and love. Um, in your depiction of the Spaniards, there seems very little hope for any redemption of any of these characters. Um, yeah. Have you worked in any more sympathetic characters into your sequels to uh, yes. War God? Yes, um, we will see this as the War God series uh, develops. There's a character um, in the first novel who is um, Father Bartolome Olmedo, mm -hmm. and, uh, Olmedo, and he actually is and does come across in the, in the histories as uh, a rather sympathetic and interesting chap. In fact, he's always telling Cortes not to destroy the idols and not to impose Christianity. He's always telling him, you can see it in many of the accounts mm. that were written at the time, um, that he, he feels there's no point in a conversion which isn't in the heart, which is forced. There's just no point in it at all. We'd rather not do it. Cortes doesn't get that. He, he uh, I mean, Cortes has his own fanatical streak. He's a most complicated character. Fundamentally, it's about money and about power. Mm. But there is a, a fanatical Christian streak in the man, which which often leads him to to conduct ex excesses, um, and it's true that amongst the Spaniards who went to Mexico, there were some. Las, Las Casas is an excellent example. Sahagun is another. Um, who and Montesinos and Montesinos, who were very good-hearted men, mm -hmm. and and uh, who detested what was being done. And, and who were courageous enough to, to state that. I mean, it's amazing to me that, that Las Casas was never executed because, because mm. when you read Las Casas, it's like reading a 21st century human rights activist and you think, yes. what mm. is this mindset doing in the 16th century? He seems completely out of place. Mm -hmm. It's a really a, astonishing courage that he had mm -hmm. to address and expose these, these terrible evils that were being committed by the, by the Spaniards. Um, and that is, you know, that is the other side of, by the way, of, of my novel, um, is that, that I do talk about Aztec wickedness, but I also talk about Spanish wickedness, mm. which actually just gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. But there are these forces that oppose it, and Olmedo is one of them. Um, and he will emerge more strongly in, um, you know, the, the, the final two volumes of the series um, than he does in the first volume. I focused very much on uh, a wicked inquisitorial character called Munoz um, in the first book, um, and I, feel, I felt that it was important to do so because that also was a reality of the Spanish conquest of Mexico. Mm. Uh, the Inquisition did come to play uh, a very significant role. There was this um, uh, horrendous destruction of pre-existing knowledge on the grounds that it was not mm. Christian knowledge, the burning of the Aztec and, and the Maya codices, for, for example. And there was a, a, a huge amount of violent murder of human beings on the grounds that they were not, uh, they were not Christians. Um, in fact, the, the, the fact that they were quote-unquote heathens was, was used as a pretext to murder them. Um, and, and the bottom line, however one cares to look at it, is that uh, Mexico, the Valley of Mexico, that whole area is estimated to have a population of around 30 million people at the time that Cortes arrives, and 50 years later that population is 1 million, 29, people, 29 million people, or whether by direct uh, genocide. Um, and that is the effect of the Spanish conquest of Mexico. And that's why I have this uh, demonic figure who appears to Moctezuma as Huitzilopochtli, Hummingbird, the war god, but the very same demonic figure appears to Cortes in the guise of Saint Peter, and what he's doing is urging both of them on 
uh, to acts of greater and greater violence. And ultimately, he sides with Cortes because he knows that things are going to get even worse that's the winning under side. the Spanish yeah. than they were under the Mexican. And that's, you know, in my, the way I look at things, that's what demons do. They're, they're in the business of multiplying human misery. And the most effective way to multiply human misery in Mexico was to let Cortes win. Hmm. Now, on that note, with talking about this, this supernatural power, which Lee Pochley and St. Peter, whom, mm. as you say, is, is for you is a, is a similar a kind of composite figure, mm. in the first part of War, War God Part 1, mm. um, there seems very little hope of any form of redemption. There seems little hope at this stage, and I've not read the second and third parts, mm. of any light that will resist these this incredible force of darkness. Mm. Do we assume that that light will come through Tozi and Malinal? Yes. And do we assume that there is some being rather like your um, the being of, of Entangled, the lady and the female figure? Mm. Is there some figure that comes through as a force of resistance to that at the supernatural plane? Yes, absolutely. There will be. Um, this is very much a part of uh, volumes two and two and three. Firstly, the, the goodness uh, in the story is very much represented by Tozi and Malinal and the young Spanish boy, uh, Pepilo, um, who will all uh, emerge much more strongly as, as characters and forces of goodness in the second and third volumes. And the second volume is already uh, completely written, uh, by the way. Um, what I'm trying to show is that even in the worst circumstances, even in the darkest place that human beings can go, even in the midst of overwhelming wickedness and evil, it is possible for goodness and love to thrive and survive and to have an impact. That's ultimately the message I'm trying to bring across. And, and I think anybody who's studied the Second World War and has studied you know, what happened under the Nazi atrocities will recognize some echoes in these two periods. That also in that period, even in the midst of the very worst things that human beings could possibly imagine doing to one another, there were tremendous examples of courage and goodness and self-sacrifice and decency. And this says something important, I believe, about the human spirit. Again, I don't want to turn away from the darkness of the period, but I do want to show that what is fundamentally good and light and beautiful and true about the human spirit was always there and did always manifest. Even if it didn't win, it was still speaking out for what we can be as a species. That's what I'm trying to show in that situation. And, and Tozi, Malinal and Pilo uh, very much uh, play that role. And yes, they will have a supernatural intervention. Thank you. Um, perhaps we might sort of... Uh move slightly away from the focus of, uh, of the novels to sure. focus on some of your other work. Um, you suggest in Heaven's Mirror and in Fingerprints of the Gods, and you cite uh, Lorette Sejourne's work of the 1950s, um, that the Aztec may have inherited a theological system mm. in which sacrifice was symbolic yeah. and was not um, material was not yeah. material. Mm. Um, have you, over the years, developed this line of thought, and do you still feel that to be a very strong narrative? Yeah, I feel that I feel that to be a very strong narrative. One of the things that has um, I found very convincing in the research I've done over the years into the possibility of a forgotten episode in, in human history of a, a lost pan global civilization of some kind is the appearance all around the world of fundamentally very similar spiritual and religious ideas, which often involve very similar iconography and very similar architecture, pyramids, for, for, for example. Mm -hmm. And this idea um, relates to what I was talking about earlier in a way, in a sense that this earth, this world, this planet on which we live, is a garden of experience theatre of experience in which in which humanity has the opportunity 
to learn and to grow and to develop and that our fundamental mission here we are here uh, as the hermetic texts put it in part to keep and tend the lower world but our real business here is to do with the perfection of the spirit we are here to learn lessons and to grow at the spiritual level and that in order to do that we need to detach from the material realm. The material realm is very convincing and very overwhelming and we have to pay attention to it. I mean if you don't pay attention to the laws of physics you do actually suffer the consequences pretty rapidly. You'll be hit by a bus. You'll be hit by a bus. <laughs> yes. um, and and the, 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 the competition and, and ferocious nature of physical life in the world is also something that we have to pay attention to. It's there. And, and the need to earn a living and the need to put food in our bellies and a roof over our heads, these certainly are primary concerns for, for, for every human being. But it's a mistake to imagine that that's actually what we're here for. That's just the process that we need to deal with in order to be here. What we're here to do is to perfect the spirit. The ancient Egyptians had a very clear idea of this. Um, that, that, that we were in a process in which we could, they saw it almost as a competition in a way, curious kind of competition um, for immortality and that how you lived your life and what you focused on played a key part in that and it would be pointless to accumulate material wealth and great power in this realm if you did not pay attention to what this was doing to your spirit and everything that you gained at the material level would actually count as a negative and a deficit in your in your spiritual growth. The ancient Egyptians understood that very well and many ancient cultures have understood that and that idea is spread. As indeed Christianity. As indeed Christianity has as well and and in fact the idea is also uh, has a shamanistic uh, element uh, uh, as well um, the sense that we are dealing with different realms, spiritual and physical realms, and that we are connected uh, through, through these realms. And it's interesting because Christianity does have this idea. And I think Christianity, if you scratch it deep enough, you, you end up with uh, shamanistic mm -hmm. experiences and you end up with direct connection with the divine. And the early Christians, to my mind, undoubtedly were the Gnostics, and we can talk about that. Mm -hmm. But then what happens is that the bureaucrats and the money men come in, the power mongers come in, and they hijack this apparatus, and suddenly Christianity stops being about the growth of the spirit, and starts being about doing what you're told mm -hmm. by the priestly elite who impose themselves as the only intermediaries between us and the, and the divine. So that, again, that brings me back to this notion that there may be forces at work in the universe which, which are actively seeking to divert humanity from from our purpose here and this is again fundamentally a Gnostic I, I, idea mm -hmm. and developing that Gnostic idea I mean you've spoken recently in a number of different uh, conferences and presentations um, about precisely this this old dialectic between pr pr primarily between the Vatican mm. and and the heretics and the yeah. heretics that do maintain that ancient Gnostic spirit yeah um, this is slightly linked to our question of earlier, but this is certainly, you can see that dialectic at play throughout history, mm. as the way you see it. And from your perspective, this is something very much at play in the society around us. I think it's very much at play today. I think it's been at play for a very, uh, for a very long time. Um, the, the Gnostics, if you go back to the early centuries of the, of the Christian era, they um, looked at it in, in this way. And, and their view is, is really, when we read it in modern terms, is a very radical and disturbing view for anybody who's committed to any of the three mainstream monotheistic faiths. And the, but to summarize, and perhaps not do complete justice to the Gnostic position, but try to put it into a very specific frame, the, the, the Gnostic view would be that that entity who is called Yahweh or Jehovah in the Old Testament of the Bible, who is the father god of Judaism, of Christianity, and of Islam, isn't a god at all. That's fundamentally what the Gnostics are saying. He's the demiurge. He is an imposter. He is a lower level supernatural entity. 
you could almost call him a demon, who has imposed himself upon this realm and seeks to be worshipped and adored and loved. And that's why once you read the Gnostic texts, you know, you, you can immediately understand the appalling behavior of Jehovah in the Old Testament. How could any God of goodness, you know, behave in that horrific way? The things that this entity is telling, you know, his chosen people to do is just horror, 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 destroy, destroy, take, this land is yours. All of that, all of that stuff all comes from this thing called Jehovah. And the Gnostics saw through all that. They said, he's not God at all. That's not, that's not God. We're being deluded. We're being misled into worshiping a demon here. And they saw God as being above and beyond all of that and, and really quite distinct from the material realm. But they, f they believed very strongly that when humanity was created and the Demiurge was involved in our creation, that when humanity was created, the, the, the plerima, the fullness, came to our rescue and, and incorporated within us a divine spark. That that is there, it cannot be denied. There is a divine spark in man. And the whole Gnostic project is to liberate that divine spark in man from the control of the Demiurge and from the control of the Archons, the evil angels who the Demiurge inserts amongst us in order to mislead us. So the Gnostics turn the Garden of Eden story upside down. Mm -hmm. and for the Gnostics, the serpent is the good guy. Yeah. Um, and he is liberating Adam and Eve. He's saying, actually, you need to eat of the tree of knowledge. You need to know of the knowledge of good and evil. You need to be able to make the, the choices between these two things in order to develop. And there is a tree of life which can be reached, which the Demiurge is doing everything he possibly can to stop you, to stop you reaching. And, and this, to mainstream Christians, is a very disturbing idea. And it led mainstream Christians in the Middle Ages to burn thousands mm. at the stake. Uh, the Cathars, for example, who held that idea. So, my my feeling is that there, that, that and it's one of the convincing <coughs> evidence pieces of evidence for for a lost civilization is that there was a, a globally distributed, worldwide spiritual system that sought to teach us not to focus entirely, or even too heavily, on the material side of our existence, but to pay attention to our spiritual development and that was often expressed in the form of metaphors including the idea that we should sacrifice the body that we should the body in the ancient spiritual system that was never intended to be taken literally that was a that was a metaphor that that um, we should ignore the body we should not focus on the body and its needs and the material realm too much because that will distract us from the spiritual quest that is what we're really here uh, to do. Um, and, and there was a whole range of metaphors um, which encapsulated the notion of ridding ourselves of the body and its demands and needs and focusing on the spiritual self. And what I think happened later as this system devolved down the ages was that later cultures picked up echoes of that system and completely misunderstood its metaphorical teachings. Uh, so that where the notion of sacrificing the body was intended to be entirely metaphorical, that we should give up our exclusive focus on the needs and demands of our bodies and focus instead on the needs of our spirit, that was taken by later cultures like the Aztecs as an instruction actually to kill bodies actually to sacrifice and destroy bodies and, 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 and uh, to, to burn them away, literally. Um, and, this, and this became part of the justification, became incorporated into the whole ritual of, uh, of, of human sacrifice and the notion that by so doing, this would somehow be pleasing uh, to the gods. Um, I think that there's a, a perverted interpretation of an ancient spiritual teaching and it's quite easy to see how it happened. All you have to do is exchange a metaphorical process for a physical action, and you end up with what the Aztecs were doing. Mm. And there's a um, there's the account of one of the uh, chroniclers, one of the uh, friars. It may have been Salgan, or it may have been um, I forget who it may have been. Mm. Um, that there was a, a Mesoamerican goddess whom. The, these friars found great sympathy 
in her with her because of her relationship with um, the Virgin. Right. And that this was a figure who demanded, who didn't demand, but uh, liked sacrifice of flowers mm -hmm. and perfumes mm -hmm. and incense yeah. and, and gifts in that nature. So yeah. in that respect, this is, this is bearing out the idea that sacrifice need not be the removing of someone's heart and chucking the body yes. down the yeah. steps. Yeah, yeah. There's, 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 there's really no ancient spiritual justification acts of violence that the Aztecs uh, carried out. Um, it was a, a devolution and a, and a perversion of, of, of an ancient and beautiful idea. And if you go back to the oldest teachings, the, the offerings are all meant not to be human beings. They are meant to be flowers and fruits. In fact, that was also the essence of Quetzalcoatl, mm. that he would stop up his ears at any notion of violence, that he, would, uh, that he demanded of his followers that they sacrifice only fruits and flowers and, and, and never, ever, ever human blood. Yeah. Um, and these are very ancient teachings in, in Central America, but somehow the Aztecs got drawn uh, into a much darker path. And not just the Aztecs. Not just Were, the Aztecs. for example, the inquisitorial fires, the autos, were they sacrifice? Well, you know, what I think, uh, what I think is interesting uh, is the, hum the humbug um, in the Christian position. Um, so a, a friar who is burning his quote-unquote victim at the stake um, the friar is saying to himself, I'm doing that to save his soul. Um, but actually, when the Aztecs saw this happening, they read it as human sacrifice to the God of the Christians. That's how they saw it. And actually, there's no difference when the friar burns somebody at the stake. In a way, that's exactly what he's doing. He's carrying out an act of violent and utterly wicked human sacrifice to his God. Mm. So in a way, the, when the Aztecs read it that way, they were right. That's exactly what the friars were doing. Dressed up in all this layer of humbug about how it's meant to save the soul of the poor uh, heathen who's being, who's being burnt at the stake. Um, and I make this point in, in, yes, in War God, yeah. that, that the act of burning at the stake is fundamentally an act of human sacrifice. No different from the, the grotesque actions of the, of the Aztecs. And on that note, this is a, a very challenging position, one that I find very difficult to even conceptualise, let alone articulate. And that is that we need not necessarily look at the Inquisition um, with our modern eyes mm. of looking at them, as we've discussed earlier, as avatars of evil. In thinking that perhaps if the Inquisitor viewed heresy as being a condemnation of that soul, then by encouraging that individual to renounce heresy, he is helping that person gain eternal life rather than eternal death. It's something which I can't, I can neither tolerate nor, nor understand, but the, as, a, as an idea, mm. to what degree could we look at the past with the eyes of the past mm and see these inquisitors as actually working in the benefit, as they saw it, of these individuals and yeah. these communities. Or, on the other hand, could we actually maintain our modern eyes and see this um, religious aspect as something of a smokescreen behind mm. territorial land grab, mm. plunder, mm. loot and conquest? Good point. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of different issues I need to touch on to, um, to address that. Um, first, first off, I think that some of the inquisitors, perhaps many of them, believed powerfully that they were doing the right thing, that, that this was a vital act to save the soul of the individual who they were consigning to the flames. I, I think a lot of them really did believe that. And it's important to reckon with the cultural context of the times and the beliefs that people had. Um, and while this does not excuse the action, mm. it does explain it yeah. to some extent. Yeah. How somebody who conceived of himself as a good person, doing good acts, actually was committing the most horrific acts of murder. And one could argue the same about Moctezuma. And one could argue the same mm. about Moctezuma. But here <laughs> we come to the next point, which is that as I, as I look at the ancient documentation on this and, and, and study it in some depth as I've done, it's pretty clear to me that individuals who we would define as psychopaths or sadists today 
were drawn to those kind of roles mm. yeah. because it provided them with an excuse to do what they really loved doing, yeah. which was yeah. to inflict misery and pain on others. And there's too many inquisitors mm -hmm. who quite obviously got great pleasure out of what they were doing um, for it all to be passed off as just they were victims of their own cultural context. Some of yeah. them really loved it and they got, I would say, uh, almost, uh, you know, o o almost um, an intense pleasure from committing these horrendous acts mm -hmm. of cruelty. Yeah. Um, and, and that has to be taken into account as well. Secondly, it's also clear that, of course, human beings are shaped by their cultural context. Um, but I think there's too much of a tendency in our society today uh, to pass everything off to the cultural context and to say that cultural context explains everything. And, that some, and, and I've even heard some people argue that we humans are not responsible for our actions because we are the product of our conditioning. And I personally profoundly disagree with that. Well, that's something of a structuralist argument. Yeah, it's a structuralist yeah. argument. I, I profoundly disagree with it, and I think we are responsible for the consequences of our actions. And even in the 16th century, as we discussed already, there were individuals like Las Casas, like Sahagun, who had been through that cultural conditioning, but had the strength of character to resist it and to say, well, actually, no, this is really wrong yeah. and we shouldn't be doing this and we condemn utterly anybody who does it and we're going to expose them to, 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 to the world for what mm. they're doing and for what they're really doing, which is the misery and suffering and, and pain that they're causing. So it was possible even then for people to rise above yeah. their cultural conditioning. Yeah. And again, it comes back to this issue of choice, that we human beings have always got the power of choice we've always got the power to choose. We may be enforced by circumstances in all kinds of ways, but it always comes down in any decision to a choice for this or for that. And we can always, even if it means our own suffering in the end, we can always make a choice not to inflict suffering on, mm -hmm. on others. Um, that is a free choice that, that, that anybody can make, even in the most difficult of circumstances. And unfortunately, most people in the 16th century didn't make that choice. Yeah. Uh, well, they, they weren't allowed to make that choice. Well, they weren't allowed to make that choice, but, <laughs> but, but, but even so, they still could have made it. It mm. just might have had very painful consequences for them. Yeah. Um, but they, they, could have, they still could have made that choice. So I think cultural conditioning is important. I think it helps us to understand the behavior of an epoch. I think it helps us to understand the behavior of the Inquisition. Uh, but I don't think it excuses it. Um, and and um, uh, it also helps us to understand uh, the extraordinary attitude of men like Cortez. Um, today we find this difficult. It's actually not so long since Western cultures were in the business of whole-scale taking over of other lands. They still are. And still yeah. are, actually, because I'm going to come to that yeah. under, under a different guise. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the kind of mindset that Cortez came with was if I can take it it's right to take it and that was how it was throughout the Middle Ages actually and through and and, and even into Renaissance and the 20th time. century and that's how it still is today <laughs> yeah. it's just cleverly disguised today it's yeah. still going on I mean frankly when a drone flies over Afghanistan uh, or northern Pakistan and wipes out 190 people at a blow you know none of whom have been involved in any act of violence against the West. What are we confronting there if not a form of human sacrifice? Yeah. Yeah. This, is, this is murder. This is murder in the name of an idea that is taking place there and that is happening routinely and that is being justified on all kinds of grounds, just as the horrific actions of the Aztecs were justified at that time, just That's as the right. horrific actions of the Inquisitors were justified at that time. We in the 21st century have our own mechanisms, very sophisticated, very clever, very widely disseminated, for justifying the most horrific actions, which at the level of phenomenology are no different from the actions of human sacrifice that we so much abhor uh, in the past. So yeah. before we condemn you know, the people of the 16th century for how they behave, we should be looking very closely at how we behave today I fully and what agree. we are doing in the world. And there's one um, marker for that that I've used in, in class, which is to call the, the big debate that took place in 1550, to call it an inquiry. Because we're now familiar with, for example, the Leavers and Inquiry looking at uh, yeah. phone hacking and the, and the, um, the inquiry into the Iraq war. Mm -hmm. Um, if we call the Violid debate of 1550 an inquiry, mm -hmm. we can see that, of course, this is, this is the same thing. Yeah. This is about a period of 
horror. Yes. In 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 our modern world, it was called the War on Terror. Yes. Um, and you can see that the very similar language is used yep. in relation to the justification of war. Yes. What what Sepulveda called the just war. Yeah is precisely what we had with Tony Blair and George Bush, Absolutely. a just war. Yes. We are doing the right thing by engaging in people who do not have our values. Mm. Our values are the right ones, their values are the wrong ones. We are doing a, a good thing. Mm. And of course, as we know, over the last decade, there's been massive resistance to that. Yeah. And as there was in Spain at yes. the time and yeah. elsewhere, yeah. only that, as, as we described, the the resistance would have been put down much more heavily yeah. as heresy, yeah. whereas today... Yeah, and those of us today who resist such ideas have uh, m more more tools at our disposal yes. than we've done in the past. And we're not burnt at the stake. And we're not burnt at the stake. Um, thank goodness, you know. Mm. But they're, but they're, they're, we are still dealing with powerful state apparatuses which are funded with our money uh, in order to impose their will not only on other peoples, but also on us who elect them, and mm. um, and indeed on the way that we think about things, because there's a very clever, sophisticated, enormously well-funded manipulation of information that, that that goes on. But nevertheless, fundamentally, I think the the internet is a tool of liberation. It does allow, allow people to compare ideas around the globe, and it does allow the instant exposure um, of uh, very negative actions and subject mm -hmm. them to, to public uh, horror. One of the the things I like on the internet is this campaigning site called Avars, you know, which is which gets people to vote on particular issues, and sometimes they can mobilise millions mm -hmm. uh, of votes against some great act of, of horror that has taken place visible yeah. and would not have been noticed. Uh, and uh, but but I think the key point is that nothing's really changed. Mm -hmm. I the agree. imposition of the will of state actors on others is mm -hmm. still going on. Mm -hmm. And um, it, and it's going on for very much the same reasons. The the, the belief that our idea is right and everybody mm -hmm. else's idea is wrong. The utter humbug yeah. that's involved in that belief. The utter disrespect for the integrity and sovereignty of others that's involved yeah. in that. This is still alive and well in the world today. And we, as human beings, our responsibility now is to oppose that tooth and nail and to prevent that happening whenever we see it and not allow anything to be done in our names which we disagree with. Yeah. And now in relation to opposition to this this force, one thing that you've described in a few uh, in, in your blog and elsewhere is what you describe as a reverse missionary movement where the Christian the Jesuits and the and the Franciscans and the Dominicans were bringing the, the, the Christianity or imposing Christianity you see now the, the possibility that the spirit of Mother Ayahuasca may be coming away from the Amazon yes. for, for a particular, with a particular mission. Yeah. Her, her time has come. It's a, very, it's a very curious process that's going on, and I've become more and more aware of it uh, over, over the last decade. Again, a complicated question to answer, and I need to touch on a number of points. The first point is um, the experience of contact with an entity or an intelligence in the visionary state that ayahuasca induces. Uh, nobody could fault me for saying, who's done the research on this, at the level of phenomenology, that this, that this experience is very widespread. Mm -hmm. That people who've drunk ayahuasca all around the world find themselves encountering an intelligent entity who more and more of them construe as mother ayahuasca. She's actually given a name. She often appears in the form of a serpent. And that, of course, to fundamentalist Christians immediately raises all kinds of alarm bells. Yeah. Uh, often also appears in the form of a, of a, of a human woman, appears in visions, uh, and has teachings to offer. And those teachings operate at a lot of different levels. People receive teachings about their own lives, about errors and mistakes that they might be making. And, and I recently published an article about this and, and, and gave, gave a, a lecture at a, a TEDx conference about how my direct contact with this perceived uh, entity in a series of ayahuasca sessions in 2011 stopped me in my tracks uh, with a 24-year uh, cannabis habit. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd like to, the moment I get onto this subject, I have to emphasize, I have nothing against cannabis. And I believe it's a fundamental human right of every adult, sovereign human right, if they wish to use cannabis to do so. And I don't think that the state or government has any right whatsoever to intervene uh, in those in those experiences. This is a, a fundamental sovereign choice. And if we're not allowed to make it, then there's something really wrong with our society. I think cannabis can be incredibly helpful. Uh, I think it can be a creative impulse. It was for me for a long time. Um, and I, I, I know that it has very powerful healing properties which should not be neglected and I, and I value and, and uh, highly respect the, the medical marijuana movement which is, which is bringing cannabis to help people in, in, in great physical distress. However, there's the question of our individual relationship with cannabis and my individual relationship with cannabis over a period of 24 years as a daily smoker um, mm. had got out of skew. I was not uh, I was not in balance with with the herb. Mm. I had become uh, dependent on it, and um, I'm not saying that the that the herb was causing me to behave in a certain way. Perhaps I'm saying that it was bringing out certain weaknesses in my own character, which were there already. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of them in particular was paranoia. Um, I became very distrusting and irrationally so. Um, filled with uh, jealousy towards my my wife and partner. Santa and and for, for quite a number of years was really making her life a, a misery with this irrational completely unfounded uh, jealousy and what I was shown in those ayahuasca sessions was that all of this was connected to my abuse of cannabis and that I really had reached a point where cannabis was not serving me any longer where I was serving it and I personally without making any comment on others relation with cannabis I personally needed to stop right away mm -hmm. and that if I didn't stop I would be falling into an abyss from which my soul would never recover. And this was presented to me so powerfully by the direct personality of ayahuasca in those visions that when I came back to England in October 2011 after those five sessions in Brazil, I couldn't smoke cannabis again. Mm -hmm. It was just gone from my life. No withdrawal symptoms. I know people say you don't get addicted to cannabis, but believe me, when you smoke it daily, you do have withdrawal symptoms. Mm -hmm. And those tend to be irritability, a feeling of dissatisfaction with life. I had none of that. It was, I was, just, it was just gone. I had no desire or wish, actually a horror, of, uh, of smoking it again. It was just completely gone from my life. So there was a, I got a teaching in those visions which has actually been incredibly helpful mm -hmm. to me. And it's taken a monkey off my back. And as others have with, with their use of uh, heroin uh, or cocaine and, or and, alcohol. And, or and this is very interesting that, that people who've been addicted to heroin or, or cocaine who've worked with ayahuasca have found themselves freed of the addiction. That's right. uh, again, they undergo revelations that allow them to see the root cause of the problem and to do something about it. Mm -hmm. So there's a teaching going on here with this, with this herb. Now, now, many might say that this is just imaginary that people are just making this up, that there is no Mother Ayahuasca, there is no goddess mm -hmm. who is seeking to contact us. And I can't prove that those people are wrong. Uh, all I can say is, until you've had the Ayahuasca experience, hold back your judgment. Yes. Hold back your judgment. Have a few ceremonies and then see how you feel about this entity that transpersonally people are in contact with all around the world. And let's consider the possibility that reality bit more complicated than we imagine and that mm -hmm. there might be other some other dimension of reality in which such an entity does exist and is interested in the human race so there are very helpful teachings at the individual level which come across whether through the working of brain processes or whether they through the actual intervention of a quote-unquote goddess I can't prove it one way or another personally I think there's an intelligence there mm -hmm. That's what I think is going on, and that's I say that after fifty or so uh, ayahuasca sessions. But I can't prove that I'm that I'm right. Now, secondly, <laughs> here's the other thing: in ayahuasca sessions, a lot of people all around the world, whether they're drinking in the Amazon jungle or in the middle of Tokyo or New York, report an intense feeling of sadness about the environment, mm -hmm. and particularly, particularly about the rainforests, mm -hmm. that something has gone terribly wrong in the human relationship to our planet and that the, and that the destruction of the rainforests which is taking place now and the wholesale destruction of the Amazon is, is a terrible crime against what we're really supposed to be 
here to do. And a suicide. And a suicide. It's a dreadful, it's a dreadful, dreadful, dreadful mistake. The short-term economic gains that come from it, which are driven by a society that focuses on short-term economic gain, are wiped out within mm. a decade, and all we're left with is ruin. Mm. And a huge source of biodiversity, a huge opportunity to learn from nature is being taken is being taken away from us it's just it's just obviously at the just at the level of pure reason alone i don't understand why the forces that are involved in the destruction of the amazon don't get this it has to stop and that is a powerful mm. powerful message of encounters with the intelligence behind ayahuasca as i construe her mm. yeah. and 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 so it's interesting that just at this time when the amazon is in the greatest danger this instrument of consciousness alteration the ayahuasca brew which is thousands of years old in the amazon and which for thousands of years has been confined to the amazon has leapt out of the amazon mm -hmm. and is appearing all around the world appearing in every great city mm -hmm. of, of of the industrialized and technological powers and is drawing people towards it, who are having the experience, who are receiving those teachings, who are having their thinking affected radically by those teachings. Um, and, and I can't help feeling that there's something behind this, that this is, there's some intentionality behind this, that this is, they always say um, in, the, in the Amazon that the real intelligence in the brew is in the vine. Mm -hmm. And that the vine, which is not highly psychoactive, has kind of grabbed the leaves that contain DMT in order to gain access to the human mind. Yeah. And I kind of like that idea that that this is a that this is a mechanism. You know, this if there is a goddess or some entity operating at another dimension or level of reality, it's pretty clear that that entity cannot intervene directly on this material plane, but it can intervene through affecting human consciousness, of course, yeah. and that's what's going on. Yeah. Human consciousness is being affected, and those who have worked with ayahuasca are receiving extremely useful personal teachings and much broader teachings that alert them to the horrors that are going on in the world and, and lead to a, to a wish to change the direction of human society. And Mother Ayahuasca will be able to withstand being abused She'll be, able, she'll be able to withstand any form of commodification or commercialization of herself. Well, it's because she's doing a, she's doing a job which is, which is beyond what can be sullied. I feel that that's the case. I feel that the, I feel that the job that is being done by ayahuasca will ultimately rise above um, any negative downside that, that, that comes from it. Certainly there are people who are using ayahuasca for commercial gain. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are people who are offering ayahuasca ceremonies who don't really know what they're doing. And I would urge anybody who wants to work with ayahuasca, really do your research carefully. Mm -hmm. Consult word of mouth. That's you know, we have to consider this like Gnostic sects in the fourth century. First of all, the action is illegal, so it has to take place under the radar. Um, and, and that means that, that the information that you need may be difficult to obtain. But use word of mouth. Listen to what other people have to say. If somebody is conducting ceremonies in an irresponsible ma manner, stay away from them. Mm -hmm. You know, learn from the experiences of others and and go in, in in the right direction rather than the wrong direction. Because there are people who are exploiting ayahuasca, and that's happening also even in uh, in Iquitos. You know, there course, are yeah. there are many so-called shamans who are r really just uh, money-hungry businessmen. But men. more to the point, and on a deeper level, there are some ayahuasqueros who are working for a nefarious goal. Definitely. There's and and you, explore, you explore that in entanglement. I explore that in entanglement. Now, you recently said, and I think it's a wonderful comment, that uh, were world leaders, politicians and corporate directors, were they to drink the brew on a number of occasions, this may help to alleviate some of the problems. How do we know, of course, that, for example, were Dick Cheney to have drank the had it conducted a few ceremonies, how do we know that he wouldn't have just been given even greater power towards his particular power-hungry goals? Very good question. Um, the way I look at it is that what the ayahuasca brew does in order to open us up to the entity that I call Mother Ayahuasca uh, is to open a door into another dimension and which the shamans call the spirit world. 
And what's out there in that other dimension isn't only Mother Ayahuasca. Mm. Yeah. There are a lot of other entities out there as well. The, 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 this duality between good and evil that we confront in this realm, in some sense it's driven from that realm, I believe. Um, and that um, and there are negative entities that seem to thrive in an almost vampire-like way on negative human behavior in that realm as well. And there's a danger when you... Like Moctezuma and the mushrooms. Like Moctezuma and the, and the mushrooms. Mushrooms can produce incredibly beneficial effects and can bring us into contact with the spirit of nature, but the Aztecs went down a different path and mm -hmm. they, used, they used mushrooms uh, intimately connected with their rituals of, of human sacrifice mm -hmm. and, and opening up a channel between Moctezuma and Huitzilopochtli, this this demonic uh, uh, entity, it's difficult to interpret him in yeah. in any other in any other way. So when or, we open or that, Charlie Manson and LSD, or Charlie Manson and LSD. Yeah. Again, many people have very yeah. positive learning experiences with LSD, but some people make the wrong choice and go down a dark road. Mm -hmm. So that's always possible. Now, I think the point to make is that that's always possible in this realm as well. Mm -hmm. uh, people, uh, this, this power of choice exists. I think that somebody doesn't just get taken over by a dark force. I think yeah. there's intentionality in it. They've got to opt for it. Yeah. They've, got to, they've got to want it. So to your be question, attracted to They've it. got to be attracted to it. So the, your question is, if we gave 10 sessions of ayahuasca to uh, an unprincipled politician uh, who was solely interested in the quest for power, is there not a danger that he would open yeah. up to one of those negative entities and even become more yeah. negative and yeah. worse at what he was doing? And I'm afraid to say, yes, there is a possibility of that. There is a possibility of that. What can control against that possibility um, is the set and setting in which the ayahuasca experience is undergone. Um, it is very important. Uh, we call them shamans, and really one of the tasks that Westerners now face working with visionary substances like ayahuasca is to develop a form of shamanism that is relevant to our culture. Yeah. Um, and fundamentally what the shaman is doing is he is protecting the space psychically against intervention by negative entities. That's what he should be doing. But some shamans, who they call brujos, in, um, they're not healers, they're not curanderos, they're sorcerers mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in Peru, for example, are doing the opposite of protecting the space. They're inviting in the darkness and the negative, and we see those consequences. So that's why I say it's incredibly important to do your research and to find that you're working with a pure-minded individual who is cultivating no cult of personality, uh, and who is only interested in service. And such individuals do exist. And I do believe that were a Dick Cheney character to be given 10 sessions of ayahuasca in a properly controlled setting with the right shamanic guidance and the right protection of the space, mm -hmm. that he probably would have a transformatory experience which, yeah. would, which would change completely his outlook on life, make him bitterly regret uh, actions that he'd conducted in the past mm -hmm. and make him wish never to carry out those actions again in the yeah. future. Um, so I believe the teaching is there, but it has to be handled in a wise and guided way. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps moving on to a question that you wanted to develop of the whole process of fiction writing and the change from the many books that you've written over yeah. the last 20 or so years and uh, these two novels that you've now published and the two that are in the pipeline. Yeah. Um, has your relationship with the whole writing craft changed? Yeah, I'm really enjoying writing fiction. Um, it's great fun for me. Uh, writing the scenes of violence, not so much fun. That is, that is um, a painful process, but I feel that I'm right to apply such skill as I have to doing that as well as I can. But just from the point of view of a pure writing exercise, um, not having to defend every argument, not having to footnote every statement, uh, is a tremendous uh, liberation. And, and I'm able to um, exercise areas of my imagination and my skills as a writer in the format of a novel 
that I was never able to exercise in non-fiction. And a curious thing, in the case of War God, in the case of Cortes and Montezuma and the, the Spanish conquest of Mexico, I have done a lot of research on that. I've done a lot of background mm. reading on the subject. And I do refer to that reading mm. while, I'm, while I'm writing the book. But what I found it's enabled me to do, which I was never able to get into this mentality when I was writing non-fiction, is to actually get into the heads of the characters. Once you start developing uh, a Machiavellian player like Cortez as a character, and you really start getting inside his head and thinking about why he did what he did, I find that I begin to understand things that yeah. would have been incomprehensible to me before. Yeah. Um, that I can that I can begin to see the whole process from that character's point of view, and then I shift to another point of view, and I'm inside that character's head and seeing it from from their point of view, and I find that that uh, the whole historical canvas has opened up for me um, in a way that it never did when when I was writing nonfiction. Mm -hmm. I do believe um, that the first responsibility of a novelist is not to bore the reader. Um, if you're going to present something as a novel, fundamentally what you are offering somebody is an engaging and gripping reading experience. Well, that's they, for non-fiction as well. Well, it's, it is for non-fiction, but non-fiction has, uh, I mean, very good if you can do that in, in non-fiction, and I've, I've tried to do that in, in non-fiction, but I would say the primary goal of non-fiction is to it's actually not the reading experience, it's the facts, the information, the debates, the arguments that are conveyed in non-fiction. Mm -hmm. And I do think that the primary role of fiction is the reading experience. That first and foremost, this must be something that is engaging to read, that you actually do want to keep turning the pages of. And as I've gone along with fiction, I've learnt quite a lot about that. Uh, and it has to do with not delivering everything at once, mm -hmm. um, but m maintaining and, and, and developing suspense and, and trying to immerse the reader in a, in a visceral way uh, in the events of the time. And, that, and, and you know, there are, are many huge battles described in, described in War God. And it's been interesting for me to get inside those experiences and, and to try to describe them and hopefully to bring them home to the, to the reader in a way that they want to keep on, keep on turning the pages. So that's the first responsibility, is, is not to bore the reader. And the second responsibility, having fulfilled that, is to have something interesting to say. To leave, to leave the reader with a feeling at the end that they've not just been entertained, but that they've, that they've found out something of value that they didn't know before uh, they, they went into it. And that's why I think that I'm going to continue writing fiction in the future, because for me, I'm not going to stop writing non-fiction. I will write non-fiction books. But for me, in fiction, I'm able to explore extraordinary ideas uh, with a freedom that I was never able to explore them in non-fiction. And that's, I think, what I value most about the process of writing fiction. And also, you're not up against the conservatism of the, uh, of the, uh, of the academic. I don't have to worry about academic criticism at all because, hey, you know, it's just fantasy. And on that <laughs> note, could you, uh, could you argue in favour of conservatism of academic thought? Oh, God, yes. In favour in the sense of the fact that some of your... Um, theories related to, for example, the that date of 10,500 BC, um, and other theories that you've yeah. um, shared with others. Is it not in favour of, of of scientific and archaeological and other academic discourses? It's in favour of them that they're resistant. Yes. So that that when a theory is robust enough, it will enact some change of paradigm, yes. as opposed to the whole edifice of the academic thought being shifted all the time. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that um, the method of criticism of new ideas, the fire of criticism of new ideas that academics routinely apply, is fundamentally a good thing. I think that, um, you know, we can't just um, naively accept uh, every thought that is put out there. We can't naively accept as fact everything that is mm -hmm. presented as fact. We do need to apply our critical faculties. Um, and I think it's, I think the fire of criticism is very helpful because if ideas fund actually survive that, then probably they've got something to them. There is, however, a danger 
you know, of throwing out the baby with the yes, bathwater. The history of science is full of examples of ideas that were in fact correct, but that were criticised out of existence, sometimes for hundreds of years. Uh, and it would have been really useful to human society if they'd been allowed in a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the, you know, the gatekeepers are, are so furious and so intent on their, on their project uh, of seeing how they can deconstruct any new idea, of looking for what's weak I agree. and bad in that idea, that, uh, that they are in danger of throwing out what's good and worthwhile in that idea. Mm -hmm. And there might be a role uh, for academia to learn from this and to say, well, as well as looking for what's weak and bad, when we criticize any idea, let's look for what's good and worthwhile in that and see where that can take us as well. Yeah. So a little bit of positive side. I agree would be with useful. that. Because the flip yeah. side of that is obviously that every new generation feels compelled at, when they're thinking radical perspectives. They have to start from scratch. And this is the case um, Frederick Myers wrote back at the end of the 19th century when people approach this whole phenomenon of the survival of the soul after death. Mm. Let them read what I've written so they don't have to start from scratch. Right, but yeah. of course, each generation has to start from scratch Rather. because of that erasing power that consensus can, yes. can impose. Yes, consensus can, can, uh, can impose a lot that isn't, that isn't helpful. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, you know, one need only think of the, um, you know, the Ptolemaic uh, system. And, and, and how long it maintained its hold, and how refinements of mm. that completely incorrect model allowed it to exist for you know centuries longer than it uh, than it actually should have. And on that note, um, the the position of ten thousand five hundred BCE mm -hmm. that you and others have, uh, mm. have, have have proposed, I gather it's gaining a certain respectability with the uh, excavations at Gobekli Tepe. Well, absolutely. I. Uh, I, I mean, I s said a, a moment ago that I, I'm not completely given up writing non-fiction, mm -hmm. and uh, I am going to be writing a sequel to Fingerprints of the Gods, and I'm aiming to publish that in, in 2015, late latter half of 2015. Uh, and the reason I'm doing that is because over the last two decades, F Fingerprints was published in 1995, over the last two decades, really quite a lot of new evidence has begun to filter out, some of it below the radar, some of it pe people are already well aware of, um, which in my view supports the hypothesis of some form of lost civilization mm -hmm. um, and specifically supports the dating of somewhere between 13,000 and 12,000 years ago, which is the middle of that is 10,500 mm -hmm. BCE. 10,500 mm -hmm. before Christ is 12,500 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's the period that I focused on in Fingerprints of the Gods. Now, like every uh, discovery of science, there is debate around this, and there's a hot debate around it now, but the evidence is growing more and more overwhelming of a gigantic comet impact with the Earth mm -hmm. in 10,900 BCE, which is 12,900 years ago, which is exactly in the window when I suggested that something happened. The cataclysm. That, the cataclysm that, that wiped out a, a, a whole civilization. Part of the problem with me making that suggestion in 1995 in Fingerprints of the Gods was I couldn't really put my finger on exactly what it was that happened. It seemed that something had happened, but it wasn't clear what it was. And I tried various hypotheses and I looked at earth crust displacement and work of Charles Hapgood, the Flemaths mm -hmm. and others, and, and, uh, but I couldn't really nail it down. This new work on the comet uh, impact uh, 12,900 years ago, which seems to be implicated in the Younger Dryas and the sudden mm -hmm. deep freeze that the Earth went into at that point, just really when the Ice Age was coming to an end, um, is, is compellingly suggestive of the kind of event that could have wiped out a, a whole civilization. So to me, to me, that on its own puts the whole issue up for grabs again. Yeah. And then, of course, the amazing site of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, uh, which is um, been excavated by the German Archaeological Institute, and where they're very firm that the older layers of that site date to 12,000 years ago plus, um, and that the site was... And that's consensus. And that's I consensus. Mean, that's consensus. But it's not very much talked about. But it well, is the BBC went there. Alice, Alice um, Roberts. What's not there. talked about are the implications of it. That's true. Yeah. The date is accepted, and it's a consensus date. Ha ha hardly mm -hmm. possible to 
to dispute it. But what that actually means for the stories we tell us ourselves about human history, that's really not been discussed at all. Oh, yeah. And I intend to discuss it in depth in the sequel to Fingerprints of the Gods. So here's the interesting thing. Gobekli Tepe, a large megalithic site, dated to 12,000 years ago, with megaliths that in certainly one case weigh 50 tons, and in other cases are in the range of 10 to 20 tons. No appar apparent background to that site at all. You don't get a culture that can create a site of that complexity with megaliths on that scale without a long background to mm -hmm. it. So that says immediately there is something missing in our story of the origins of human civilization. Something radically missing. And it's missing in that window between 12,000 and 13,000 years ago. When we know now, or so it seems, that the Earth was hit by a gigantic comet which had global effects. Um, that missing background is what intrigues me and, and what that implies. And I strongly intuitively feel that it implies a, a major forgotten episode in human history and a, a, a lost civilization. And I intend to look into this uh, in depth in the sequel to Fingerprints of the Gods. The other thing that's interesting is the whole question of carbon dating. Um, it's really problematic in megalithic sites around the world uh, to come up with definite dates because it's very difficult to date the cutting and shaping of uh, a stone monument. Um, and the way it's done is to look at, carbon dating can only date organic mm. materials, is to look at organic materials that are in some way or another associated with those megaliths and to say, well, they date from 5,000 years ago or 2,500 years ago, therefore those megaliths date from that period. And that's the assumption that has driven the whole timeline of uh, academic history as we, as we have it. The problem is that many, many, many of these sites are never approached by archaeologists when they're in a pristine state. They are sites that have been lived on and lived over by subsequent cultures for thousands of years. All kinds of different human footprints have mm. been left on those sites. All kinds of things have been happening. The stones may have been moved around. People may have done all kinds of stuff with them, leaving their own carbon footprint there at the, at the time. And I've, I've long suggested that, that it may be the case that some megalithic sites that we confidently date to 1500 or 2000 years ago or 5000 years ago may actually be much older than that yeah. and that what the carbon dating record is looking at is more recent interventions on those sites by later human cultures. Gobekli Tepe really underlines that because something very special happened at Gobekli Tepe. The work started about 12,000 years ago, but 10,000 years ago the site was deliberately buried. Yeah. It was just covered up. We don't know why. With no human remains either. No or, human or remains. Tools. We don't know why it was done, but whoever was organizing and behind that site took a decision, first of all, to hide it, and secondly, to preserve it. And that's what they did. And that's why the German Archaeological Institute can be confident of the vast antiquity of Gobekli Tepe, because no later cultures have been trampling all over that's it, right. bringing in new carbon. Um, and, and I think that that's, very, that's a very interesting issue, and I think it raises question marks over a number of megalithic sites in the Mediterranean, and I intend to raise those question marks over, for example, the Maltese mm -hmm. uh, megalithic sites. Yeah which uh, have a, 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 an astonishing resemblance. They do, they look Gebe similar. They look That's very right. similar yeah. to Gobekli Tepe. And the Taula uh, uh, megaliths in uh, Menorca mm -hmm. as well, which have traditionally been dated to a much yeah. Which again have that, have that T-shaped structure. That T -shape, yeah. T -shape structure, astonishingly like Gobekli Tepe. Yeah. And I think, it, I think it raises questions over the dating of almost all major megalithic sites oh, uh, yeah. around the world, which need to be looked at. So I think it's very important for that reason. And on that note, perhaps this might be my last question, um, but this is a question that I, I spend a lot of my time thinking about. One can argue that the megalithic sites all over the world with their extraordinary intricate patterns and joins mm -hmm. and the, 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 the sheer extraordinary capacities of these people can be explained in relation to man hours. If you had enough people and are really enough people and enough time you could cut these blocks in this way even if they're hard granite such as Tiwanaku mm. 
you can do it by simple labour. Mm. I find that difficult to accept. I have a sense, an intuition, that there was some form of technology that we do not know about, we have we've yeah. lost. Well, when you let your imagination roam over this matter, what do you? How do you see this? I completely share your intuition. Uh, I don't think it is just a matter of man hours. Um, it's been my privilege to climb the Great Pyramid five times, to scramble all over that stonework, to really look at it closely, to be inside and outside it over a period of twenty years, and. I just can't figure out any way, however many man hours you grant, that this extraordinary thing could have been done. It's uh, almost, I hesitate to use the word, almost magical mm -hmm. uh, in what was, what was achieved there. And uh, the same is true of uh, Saxe Huaman mm -hmm. uh, outside of uh, Cusco yeah. um, in the Andes in, in, in Peru. Um, this sight literally beggars belief yeah. and I resist all of the efforts to explain it away in a humdrum manner and I think we are dealing and I, I believe new research will prove this and I'm aware of some research that's going on in Peru right now right. which is dealing with those megaliths which which is strongly suggestive of this and I'm going to be going to Peru later this year to, to look at that. Um, I strongly believe that, uh, that a technology that we don't understand that we have not developed in our society was at work and was used uh, in these in these ancient megaliths um, and uh, you know we do everything we're used to thinking in terms of mechanical advantage that's how our society moves things um, and, and gradually as we've gone down that road and I'm going to get a little mystical here uh, the powers of the mind have been neglected. Mm -hmm. the, the, we, we hear rumors of telepathy and telekin mm -hmm. telekinesis um, and, and some respectable scientists like, like Rupert Sheldrake have, have pre presented quite interesting arguments about the existence of I those. think we've, we've seen more than rumors, we see evidence. Yeah, evidence, evidence, evidence for it, which the mainstream strongly resists. Uh, but it seems that there is a faculty of direct influence of matter from the mind. Uh, in the human story and I think our society has let that faculty grow dormant uh, but I think that it might have existed at a very high level uh, in ancient times and when you look at ancient accounts for example from Egypt of groups of priests raising gigantic megaliths into the air using a particular chant using yeah. using sound using an intense focused use of sound I think we're beginning to look at hints of that kind of yeah. that kind of technology at work, and that's one of the things that I want to do in the sequel to Fingerprints of the Gods is to try and explore what this technology might have been, yeah. and how it might have and how it might have operated. And I do believe it's not supernatural. I believe it's something that's within human capacity, but that it's it's become dormant in modern society. And because it's dormant, our rationalist thinkers want to believe it could never exist. I That's think right. Wrong. Or it's explained that lovely legend which I've always found very, I've always been very sympathetic to, of Merlin bringing the stones, the sarsens of Stonehenge. Fantastic story, yeah. bringing them course, from Africa, yeah. No, all, all from Africa, all yeah. from the Preseli Hill, I mean from well, the Wales. The, I mean but, the legend in the, in the Arthurian tradition is that they involved Africa. in bringing them from Africa. But of yeah. course that could embody within it the yeah. idea of something that we would consider to be magic yes. today yeah. being something that was a force, yes. an empirical force. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. and and yet this is something that still I think there's a long, long, long way to go in relation to exploration of this. Very long way to go because firstly we have to overcome our own reference frame. That's right. And our, yeah. our own material prejudice. And overcoming one's own reference frame is one of the most difficult things for science to do. Uh, and secondly, having overcome it, we then need to investigate it in depth yeah. and we need to listen to what the ancients said and we need to look at the monuments with fresh eyes yeah. and consider what they, what they might yeah. really mean. And what I think they mean is something of enormous importance that we've forgotten about ourselves and that we really quite desperately need to recover. I think that's a lovely way to end. It's good.